Hey guys, welcome back to Murder and Retrograde. We took a little bit of a week off. I hope you guys all had a good Passover, Easter, spring break, all the things. Yeah. <laughs> so we're back and we're refreshed and we've got a lot for you, I feel like, today. So yes, we do. Let's get right into it. Um, first, we wanted to cover a case that happened a long time ago. It was in 2013, but there's been some recent developments that will shake you to your core. So let's get started with the first case of Kendrick Johnson. I'm Brittany Sheffrin. I'm Jenna Kaplan. And this is Murder in Retrograde. So in 2013, 18-year-old Kendrick Johnson was living with his family in Valdosta, Georgia. He played football for the Loundis High School, because he lived in Loundis County, and his family and friends described him as a sweet and quiet boy. He, His mother says he would light up a room, he was very sweet and kind, and grew up in a really diverse area of Georgia, and his mom made a point of saying that he had friends of every ethnicity, every religion. He just was one of those people that never saw color ever since he was a young young boy. And um, so he played basketball, track and field, but neither of those came close to his passion for football. And he was really good at football. He dreamed of one day playing professionally, but unfortunately, all that changed on January 11th, 2013, when Kendrick's dead body was found by students who entered their high school gym. He was found rolled up in a standing gym mat, meaning the mat was rolled up and it was standing vertically with his body inside head first, so head down. Almost a full day passed until his body was even discovered. As he was upside down, the blood would have rushed to his head and uh, eventually it he began to bleed from his facial orifices. And um, you can see the picture, Jenna, I put it in our script right now. Do you wanna try to describe it for people that, because it sounds strange, right? Being inside of a gym mat. So I think if you were ever in sports in high school, first of all, you know exactly what Matt we're talking about. Cause like, I remember just from cheer having to roll up these things and they're like that blue, like thick um, padded mat that you would roll up. And literally it's like, it weighs a ton too, and to just to stand them up. So the picture is from like a bird's eye view of the top of the mat. And all of you, all you see is um, shoes to the side of his body. So you see his socks and his, he's up. So you see him upside down with his feet up in the air, um, his socks and his shoes are next to him. And then he's got, obviously looks like, I don't know, maybe shorts on or something. Um, but it's, even though you don't see a lot, it's, it's quite disturbing. Yeah, definitely. And he, so yeah, he has stocking feet. He doesn't have his shoes on, but he has socks on, but his feet, I'm uh, sorry, his shoes are, wouldn't you say behind his knees? Yeah. Okay. So the whole idea of the theory that law enforcement came up with was that Kendrick had put his shoes inside the gym mat because a lot of kids around the school didn't want to pay for lockers. Apparently you have to pay for them at this point. So they would like lift the gym mat and put their stuff there as like a locker and it would be safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, maybe that was done, but that, that makes no sense because there are shoes on top of him, two pair of shoes. And then, you know, you wouldn't dive head first down. I mean, it, I guess the reason maybe that they came up with that is when they unrolled it, he did have one arm outstretched. Hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? So one yeah. arm is down and one arm is up kind of like they're reaching. So maybe that's where they came up with, with that idea. It sounds very Ludicrous. strange to me. <laughs> very, very strange to me. And the opening is very small of, you know, where yeah. his and body when you're is. And at the when you're looking at the pictures, like the shoes are obviously been placed in there. That's, there's no way they were like in there first. And he went to like, I, that just makes no sense. Yeah. It, I don't, I don't understand how a person would be able to, if they didn't have any arms, then put their shoes on top of them. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. 
So the mat in which Johnson's body was found was roughly six feet tall when rolled up and yeah. put vertically. And then the hole that he was found uh, in was 14 inches wide. And Johnson's shoulders measured 19 inches across. He was five foot 10. And this is a big muscular football player. But cops believe he could have scrunched his shoulders in order to fit in there. Again, I, I don't understand why, but okay. So, and then all of the other gym mats around are rolled really tight. Yeah. Like the the center, you can, it's almost completely. But then this one has a hole. So it, just like as a, I don't know if you probably never dealt with them because you were in soccer. But no, just, never. So you, it takes like three to four people in a row and you have to like keep them tight to like in order to get them to like, I don't know why, but I just always remember being like, oh my God, this is the worst. Cause you have to just kind of constantly get them in tight yeah. and roll them. And they're freaking heavy. So the fact that you're standing this six foot thing up with a person inside of it, like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. It, it's, it makes no sense. His dad even attempted to get inside of the, of a mat that was that wide. And there's a video of it. He can, he can't get his shoulders in and yeah. he is really trying to get in there and it's impossible. So, I mean, does this mean that he was rolled up in this mat first? Was he already injured? Was he already dead? There's so many questions. And yet the local law enforcement concluded that it was an accident within one day after finding his body, which gives zero time for investigating, which what was like a super complex crime scene, you know, like so much going on, so much evidence to collect. And it just, the crime scene just got, kept getting more confusing. For example, there's a black and white gym shoe that was laying on the ground below Jack Kendrick Johnson. And this was the one that he was believed to be reaching for, but it was on top of a pool of blood, but there's zero blood on the shoe itself. How does that happen unless a shoe is placed on top of that pool of blood? Yeah. There's a picture of it, Jenna. What yeah. do you, you know, like how, how would that, obviously the blood is coming from Kendrick, but why wouldn't it get on the shoe? Wait, so do, are these his shoes or no? These are a separate pair of shoes. This is supposedly the shoe he was reaching for. The pair of shoes that are on top of him, nobody knows whose those are. Oh. And they were not taken into evidence because so they, they weren't think, Kendrick's okay. shoes. I see now. I see now. They weren't taken in evidence? Is that what you just they said? They were not taken into evidence. Oh my... I can't. I that okay. Um, yeah, no, the shoe is it looks like I mean this one makes more sense, right? It's on the ground because if he was under the mat, like it would be there and it does look like it's on top of the blood. So I don't know if that means I mean, I don't know if that means the crime happened and then somehow the shoe was then placed underneath, like a whole I mean, I cannot believe those other shoes were taking into freaking evidence. That's crazy. So also found at the scene were a hoodie and then this pair of orange and black gym shoes. There were traces of blood also on the walls nearby, but the blood was tested and revealed to not be Kendrick Johnson's blood. So then law enforcement and the school said, oh, well, it's been there a long time. It's probably from past events. And the hoodie and the orange and black shoes were not Kendrick's, so they were never taken into evidence, as I said earlier. That's bananas, because you think about it, like, any crime scene, most, well, the real ones out there are going to flag every little piece, because you don't know. You don't know what's a part of the crime scene and what's not, and so if it's in the vicinity, you're going to flag it, tag it, bag it, whatever, so that way it gets at least checked off. You don't, you can't just say, oh, that's, that's insignificant. It's on his body. But you yeah, know, that's madness. So exactly. And the case was closed on April of 2013 when police determined Kendrick's death was accidental and the cause of death was determined to be positional asphyxiation by the county medical examiner. So because of the position he was in, he, he suffocated. So he went to yeah. reach for his shoe, bl suffocated and blood everywhere. Yeah. And that's natural. Right. So obviously Kendrick's parents and close fa family and friends felt there was foul play from the beginning. They thought the sheriff's department was 
far too quick to rule it as accidental and to rule out foul play as, you know, a possibility. So another very important aspect to this case is whether or not the body was moved because the Johnsons are sure of it. They definitely think that he was moved. And this has been corroborated by the Loundis County coroner, Bill Watson. He looked over the case and definitely believes that the body was moved and that the coroner in, that looked at it in the first place just mismanaged the entire thing. What do you mean moved? Like was killed somewhere and then moved in to be hidden in here or? Yes, killed and then wrapped, put in the gym mat and made it look like he was reaching for something. So but something basically, had happened prior. So basically proving that this bullshit theory of like falling into the inside the mat could not have been yeah. an actual theory. And it, it was incredibly difficult to, I mean even look at Kendrick's face after he had been upside down for that period of time, as one would imagine. However, EMTs remarked and put in their records that he did have bruising on the right side of his jaw. So keep that in mind. So in April of 2013, just three months after the murder, the county coroner gave an interview to news station in South Georgia, North Florida. And he said that Georgia state law dictates the coroner must be contacted immediately within the discovery of a body. But Watson claimed that he was not notified until six hours after they had found the body. What? It's what? very, very strange. And furthermore, Jack, or sorry, Johnson's parents argued if this was an accident, how could no one have heard Kendrick wow. calling for help in a high school with 3,000 students in it? It happened in the middle of the school day. And we all yeah. know that the gym, it might not be in use, but people are constantly always walking out. by it, going in it. There's all, the gym's always like the kind of a hub of a, of a school. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense at all that this would all happen and and nothing would be heard. So they the Johnsons began to believe that their son's death was not being taken seriously and unfortunately it felt like that was because of race. And they just kept demanding to get another independent pathologist to do a second autopsy. So on May 8th of 2013, a judge granted Kendrick Johnson's body be exhumed for a second autopsy. This time, the findings were completely different. The pathologist found that Kendrick Johnson died because of an unexplained, apparent, non-accidental blunt force trauma. He added, sorry, you have a question? No, I'll just say, so clearly he thinks that this isn't an accident, mm -mm. right? Like no. He made a point of saying non-accidental blunt force trauma. It he took, added, what, "This is the third one at this point. Are we on number this three? Is the second. The second. This is the okay. Second I'm just trying autopsy. to Okay. Yeah. He um, found that Kendrick had suffered hemorrhaging on the right side of his neck, which is exactly where the EMTs had said that they saw bruising, and he said it. It had every um, telltale sign of blunt force trauma to that area. So the most unsettling part of this is not even that. It's like already the most upsetting murder, but the pathologist, when he opens Kendrick's body, discovers that all of his internal organs are gone. I mean, uh, how, how is that? How, how is that, how is that and possible? And even worse, his body was stuffed with newspaper in the place of where his organs were supposed to be. So, and I'm talking everything, his brain, like everything in his, in his torso down to the pelvis was gone. And that and doesn't raise some serious red flags for people. Like, you, I know, I know before you get as horrified as I was, the medical examiner's office said that this is done from time to time if the body is found late and the organs are heavily decomposed. So the funeral home said they received the body without the organs. And so it's common for a funeral home apparently to stuff the body and they use sawdust and they use newspaper. So then it was like, okay, so maybe it was done 
at the funeral home. So mm-hmm. then his parents sued the funeral home and they weren't able to prove anything. They said for sure that when they received the body from the medical examiner's office, there were no organs. So it was like a, who are you going to believe? So these p- poor parents, I mean, they have had to do so much work to just get get to the truth, you know? It's just, like to shame on the funeral home for not trying to like find out why that is. If it's, because that obviously sounds like it's not the norm. How, what, like there's so many so many places this could have turned around and nobody yeah it's very strange because this pathologist says oh yeah it's done from time to time and and then i went and i looked at like the association of medical examiners and the association of uh, funeral directors and they said that they don't do this this is not a common practice that they don't take out the organs I mean, clearly, a funeral home doesn't have like a bio. Ha- well, I don't. Know I would think about the only. Talk- no, yeah, I think the only way that that would make sense is if they're donating them. Maybe right, like you donate your organs. That's gonna. Where is that being taken out at exactly? Probably during autopsy. I would imagine. No, no, no. You have to do that when they're still alive. When if you die, donate- you have you when you you have on your license like donate organs. That's like when you die. But it's if you're if you're too far gone to survive, like like if people are in a vegetative state. Um, have you ever heard of they keep them alive? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that yeah, they can yeah. Donate. Okay, you can say that it would, would be dead. Sense. Right, right, right. I was thinking like that was just to me it was like oh that makes sense. Like you're giving them. I mean whatever. Okay, the yeah. blonde of the group here. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, the family again tried to sue, were given no answers whatsoever. And so they went to the FBI and begged them to help intervene and and they received no new information from them and they just kept waiting and waiting. And finally they asked for a third and final autopsy to be done, which they did. And the cause of death was again determined to be blunt force trauma to that side of the neck. Mm. So years passed and still nothing until July 21st, 2015, when SWAT teams descended on two homes and they carried out search warrants for two persons of interest. They went to high school with Kendrick and they played sports with him. Their names are Brandon and Brian Bell. And their father just so happens Mm. to be an FBI agent. What do you know? He works with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, which is who had the body before they are the ones that gave the body to the funeral home. And he was in charge of that, their father. So um, they went about these search warrants. And then the guys, like, I don't know why they did this, but the kids then talked to the news and they talked to them a lot right after the search warrant and they brought them into their house and they asked them pointedly so many times, did you do this? Did you have anything to do with this? And I mean, I know this is all psychology stuff, Mm -hmm. but there were so many micro expressions and like going like this and like looking off to the left when they were talking. It just people are so dumb. If you are guilty of something, why are you inviting media into your home? Like and it was such an obvious case of acting like I have no idea why they're here. It's like the weirdest thing, you know. Um, and but the interesting thing, uh, part of this is they were awarded this warrant because obviously you have to show them the search warrant by a judge and the crimes that they were looking for evidence on were witness tampering and obstruction of justice. So nothing about the murder, Hmm. but it looks like they had, they believed they could find evidence for at least those two crimes. So the bulk of what they took were all of their phone records, all of their uh, hard drives and emails and all of that. And then Brandon ended up losing his full scholarship to college. He had a football scholarship. And again, they just, they kept doing these interviews with WSB TV. Is their dad not beating the shit out of them after they do these interviews? Like, it sounds like daddy did a little covering up for you and then you're just running to the media. Like, I can't imagine that they're doing it without him knowing though, you know, like I I highly recommend going on YouTube and watching them. They're very, 
Very interesting. So the Johnson family continued to push for more help on their son's case with little result until 2018 when law enforcement finally released the surveillance camera footage from the gym from the day of Kendrick's death. And there were four cameras in the gym and more in the hallway, you know, like where you walk back and Mm -hmm. forth before entering the gym. However, when they handed the evidence over, the tapes had chunks missing. First of all, they weren't originals. They so the police said that it was up to the school district to provide the tapes to them. Mm-hmm. And many other law enforcement people were interviewed and they said absolutely not. When you're in law enforcement, you go in and you take the you entire take the system. Yeah. Yeah. You take the whole thing. Yeah. And they allowed the school district to make copies and so on these copies of these four cameras, there's huge chunks missing around the time they believe something happened to Kendrick. And also the mat where he was found was found in the only blind spot of these four cameras. So the IT specialist said the whole system should have been taken. The files should never have been given to the school. And the cops say they had nothing to do with that part. And it just, it, it's not, How can you even use that evidence? It could have been falsified. I don't understand how that's going to hold up in a court of law. And it's just so frustrating that they didn't take, the police didn't take them that day. You know, they waited so long. It just seems like from the get, they knew something. Because they didn't take certain things into evidence. They didn't go get the tapes. Like, were they giving people time to clean up their messes? I just, ooey. So this case has been closed and reopened and closed and reopened. And so it's just kind of been the, they keep closing it. And then just recently, a new sheriff came to town in Lowndes County. His name is Ashley Polk. And he is like on it. I don't know if this is, I want to make a splash because I'm the new sheriff in town or if he's really into it at this point, I don't care as long as he finds out the truth and it it seems like he really cares though because the spokesperson for kendrick's family is this man named marcus coleman and the marcus coleman the spokesperson for the family um got together and they kept writing to the fbi trying to get all of the uh, evidence back because he wanted to bring it back to the sheriff's department and they wanted to start looking at it because it doesn't seem like the feds are doing much of anything and the evidence is just sitting there it's It's in Ohio for some complicated reason. They had to move districts and things like that. But anyway, they just kept writing to these people. And even the sheriff was, he's been asking them, um, he started asking them in April of 2020. And then in March of 2021, 17 boxes showed up and they finally got all of the information and so they're going to obviously i'm sure start digging in and trying to find some new information try to look at this with a fresh set of eyes and find out what happened so uh, marcus coleman the family spokesperson said that he believes that this evidence in these 17 boxes will alter the course of the investigation He said, quote, for it to be reopened is righteous and just. Kendrick Johnson will go down in history. It's a shame that it took eight years and two months, but justice delayed is justice denied. Those 17 boxes in Lowndes County are there for a reason. And again, each one of them represent a year of Kendrick's young life because, of course, he was murdered when he was 17 years old or he died when he was 17 years old. And then in March of 2021, some shocking new information came to light. There was a possible confession from one of the bellboys caught on tape. So someone who remains anonymous, I couldn't find out who it was, called Kendrick's mother. And this is a family member of the Bells. And they said, we have one of the boys confessing to the murder on tape. For a thousand dollars. What the? F- so of course this mother gives the money immediately, gets the tape, and immediately gives it over to police. Police knew all about it, everything. I, what do you mean they knew? Oh, I was like, I would have just called the police. That I'm being blackmailed. Go get this fucking tape. Sorry. Maybe I, they did. I I don't know. 
Oh, they didn't explain. They just said she bought it. She gave it to the cops. I mean, we would have all done the same thing. So Marcus Coleman came out right after the hearing when they listened to this tape. And obviously they can't play the tape for anyone, but he came out with a quote from it. And he said on the tape, one of the boys says, they're going to catch me anyways. I should have never done this. I was young and stupid. Kendrick didn't deserve this. They're going to catch me anyways. So this was secretly recorded and Ashley Polk, the, the sheriff, is he's optimistic but he came out and said this could be a hoax this happens a lot like awful things are done to mothers looking for it's it's so messed up but people do like to do that so they said it's going to take a minimum of six months to find out who the person is on the recording for sure prove it find that person and then try to try to get some information and hopefully justice and then there's also another affidavit that came out. Jenna, I think you know something about so, it, about another witness. So this must have been in those boxes. It, it makes sense now because I didn't know about the evidence that just like showed up because the day this was executed on was August of 2017, which actually makes this more disturbing, right? That it's been like just sitting there. Someone who was said that they had met Brendan Bell in April of 2016 and on one occasion with him at his apartment in Florida, he told he told this person that the younger brother had killed Kendrick Johnson. According to Brandon Bell, Brian Bell, Ryan Hall, and Kendrick Johnson, oh, sorry, I think I said Jackson, Johnson, were in the gym when an argument between Brian and Kendrick began. The argument was about or over Brian's girlfriend. According to Brian Bell, Brian was taking steroids at the time and out of, quote, road rage, roid rage, for the effects of steroids, he struck Kendrick in the neck with a 45-pound weight or dumbbell. Bra- uh, Brandon Bell stated that Brian Bell, uh, oh, basically the blow may have been had broken Kendrick Johnson's neck, is what it says. Which you've already spoken to all of the hemorrhaging and stuff in the neck area, so that exactly and he says what weight it was to me lends a little bit more. Um, no pun intended, yeah. wait into what he's saying. Uh, according to Brandon Bell, Ryan Hall was a witness to the fight, and Brian Bell told Ryan Hall that if he didn't keep quiet and help him move Kendrick Johnson's body, his father, now retired FBI special, a- special agent, would make sure that Ryan Hall would, quote, pay for it. Um continues and says Brandon Bell also told him that his father got in touch with Sheriff Chris Prine after being notified of the fight and Kendrick Johnson's death. Brandon Bell also told me that Sheriff got in touch with the county coroner. Brandon Bell also told me that his father got in touch with another FBI agent who in some way facilitated the editing of the high school surveillance video by corrupting or deleting some one hour and 25 minutes of the original recording. Brandon Bell also told me that Kendrick Johnson's death, that his organs were removed and newspapers placed in the cavity so as to interfere with any effort to establish the correct time of death or otherwise disclose any other injuries. Brandon Bell has also told me the autopsy was falsely documented. And then it goes into all the legality of like what he's saying is true. Wow. So this has been in a box maybe since 2017? So that's, I guess, how you do it. You move stuff around, you put it in a box, and you call your buddies at the coroner's office and the sheriff's office and just, wow. I mean, I know there's connections in every occupation, but it's revolting. And this is exactly the reason that law enforcement doesn't have a great reputation in this country this kind of crap yeah so oh thank god that this family won't hasn't given up and um gosh i hope those boys something happens to them because that's awful awful and i think too is as we watch cases like this and then the next one we're going to talk about parent the family being involved and vocal can make such a difference Yes, And I think that it's just important to 
you know, look up a way that you, they can be supported, whether you're watching their TikToks or seeing if there's some sort of fund for whatever. Um, I'm, you know, it just helped these families get the justice and thank goodness for this new sheriff. Cause I feel like he, um, hope maybe will try and get to the bottom of it. I certainly hope so. I mean, I hate that it be- it's like a political thing. Yeah. It should have nothing to do with it. But from what he said, it sounds like he really wants to help this family. And I hope that he does. Me too. So, sad. so that's it with Kendrick Johnson. And we will keep you updated, of course. Mm-hmm. But Jenna, you have a very recent case update for us. <sighs> So if you've been watching us, you know my heart is with Maya Millette. And I know that sounds crazy because I've never met the woman. But for some reason, I just feel connected to her in a weird way. So this case is literally changing by the day. Uh, So let me just give you what the newest stuff is. So um, Today, a source, according to Fox News, has come out about a time he overheard Larry talking about his marriage issues and an excerpt from this news coverage. Are you ready for this? Yes. Well, Maya Millette's husband suspected her of having a boyfriend, and that's where the accusations against Larry Millette take an even darker turn. The witness who'd heard the conversations firsthand told Fox News exclusively then Larry Millette frequently discussed paying someone $20,000 to kill his missing wife's alleged boyfriend. Larry Millette seemed pretty serious, the witness said, about the alleged murder-for-hire plot. He allegedly started connecting the plan last summer when he first suspected his wife was seeing someone else, but mentioned it as recently as January 4th, which was just a few days before Maya went missing. And... One of Maya's family members said Larry had made threatening comments about the alleged boyfriend last summer saying, I want to, quote, do something to that fool. So he's got it in his head, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but he's got it in his head that she has a boyfriend and he's talking about murder for hire. So it seems like he knows who the boyfriend is if he's trying to hire somebody to kill him. But Um, you haven't, they haven't said who they think it is. Said any, yeah. I mean, I would, well, I wouldn't assume anything actually. But I'm telling you, I feel like that, that's why they've been so quiet in this case. I feel like there's a lot of evidence because they haven't really come out and asked the public for much, you know? Yeah. So um, I'll get to all of that. But, Um, So this all came kind of came on the heels of another thing that came out from, I guess, a family member who wants to be anonymous had told Fox News exclusively um, about a statement that her loved ones had made on vacation when they all went on that camping trip. Warning, Maya apparently said, if anything happened to me, it would be Larry. So you're hearing, you know, a few days ago, she's made this comment. And then now comes another story of that he's tried to allegedly hire someone to kill this supposed boyfriend. So, you know, not looking great. I mean, uh, it's never happened to me. But if I had a friend that was like, if I turn up dead, I'd be like, you're moving into my house. Yep, I'd be like, and you're done. We're coming. We're, Let's we're- not w- wait for that. Or yeah. And I would tell everybody I knew so that it was out there and they had no way of getting away with it uh, i mean especially a sister i'd be like okay you're not leaving my house and locking well, all of the doors they don't say who the family i don't think it was because mary chris has been very vocal and everything and it's just as a family member who wanted to be anonymous so, okay. so i don't know um so then some more interesting news mary chris and richard the sister and brother-in-law spoke out about how they've they started working with um, this semi-retired lawyer uh, and investigator, Billy Little, and he's he's the founder of this um, foundation called the Cold Case Foundation. So they started working with him apparently two days after Maya went missing, which I thought was interesting. Um, and the found so the foundation is compromised of experts who volunteer their time to help law enforcement agencies solve certain cases. Um, Little said that he had substantial information about the case, which could lead to an arrest. He said he turned information over to the police and that the department took the information, but turned down his help. 
So I don't necessarily think that that's a red flag because he could just he could well, mess up something. Right. And it gets more interesting with this guy because I I don't know how to feel about him. So um I don't know. Okay. So he's Well, can I just say the first red flag was Billy Little? I don't know. It's actually Billy Little Jr. <laughs> no, it's not. There's more, there's more than one. Okay, sorry. I'm a terrible person. Go ahead. <laughs> so this attorney, like I said, he on his website, he's, quote, semi-retired. But he does have an extensive resume. Because I was like, I don't know about him. So he's worked um, a lot of death penalty cases excuse me, cases and military crimes. So Billy Little was a criminal defense investigator for the United States Navy. Oh, this wow. is interesting because he had just come out saying that he had done a walkthrough of the home four days after Maya went missing. But Larry in a statement said, quote, he lied and presented himself as NCIS to gain access into my home. He misrepresented himself to gain access to my family's home as well. Claiming to be NCIS, he lies and misrepresents himself, posing to be law enforcement. I'm not qualified, or I'm not quite sure if impersonating NCIS is a crime, but it should be. And Billy is saying that's not true. So, so um, can, remind me what NCIS stands so for. So it's like the Navy. Naval Criminal. Shoot, investigative squad or something. So, so, he, so he was with NCIS, well, but he just he used that. With- it's I, it's it's a little fishy because they all this is all kind of within a military environment um, right larry works now he doesn't work for the military but he works in like a government building as an yeah optometrist, i think and she was working and she's in the navy um so he was a criminal defense investigator for the united states navy so i would imagine that's the same thing right i don't know i would think so, so i don't know if he just didn't say he's not currently I, yeah. I, it sounds like he probably wasn't 100% clear, but, like, I don't know that I'm taking Larry's word for it either. But yeah, exactly. So, it, interestingly enough, he let him in to his house four days after all of this had happened. And Billy says that when he walked in, all the windows were open, fans were full blast, and he said it was cold in there. And he said immediately oh, no. what he was trying to do was smell for any sort of decomp. Bleach. Or bleach. Oh, yeah. Like, smells of cleanup. Um, and the only, and he said he didn't smell anything, but he did come across a hole that had been patched in the bedroom door. So he said it was like this big and basically looked like if you were trying to, um, if somebody was locked in there essentially, and you're trying to get in, you could have <gasps> punched a hole through to unlock, to unlock the door. it. And so that was there and it had been patched. Um, I thought you were going to say like the punched the door like i never would have even thought like to get out oh my goodness or to get in like maybe she locked right and right so um so that's weird right and then i don't really know how he's getting this stuff but he has attained text messages that i i believe are from larry's phone and um one of the images which you have saw seen you have seen wow um is a shrine of sorts mm-hmm. of maya and larry and there's like a thing of like maybe palo santo with like some red twine and there's like lit candles but then also it looks like, like an altar yeah but there also looks like there's blood spatter all over it and again this it's kind of weird because in the image it says larry millet and then it says september 16 so he sent that to her family that's how they have it in September? They were of 2017. In 2017? Yeah, when they were together. They had been fighting. This is what I read on because it was okay, on the I Daily Mail yesterday. Okay. And they said that that image was uh, from a family member because he sent it when he was fighting with May, Maya, about something, maybe this sup- alleged boyfriend, he sent that to all, the whole family. Okay, because it's a picture of them together. No, I'm glad. Yeah, so it's right. It's them together. I'm glad because when, when I read it was the art. It was Fox News about Billy's story, but it wasn't information about where the context of these images. So it's just the image, and you see it, and I saw the dates, and I was like, I'm so confused. But like, yeah, wow, how it was this just is all clickbait. 
okay. I think people just wanted to have that image and then they didn't really explain anything about it. Got it. So, but it's still disturbing as like, what? Yeah. Because at first I was like, um, this is obvious that he did it, but I thought it was just a picture of her. But then when I realized he sent it to the family and it was like, like our marriage is over, like both of us, it's, it's still creepy as all get out, but still, I don't know. So kind Very... of in the same lines and probably around, I don't, again, this looks like it was more taken from like his notes section. I don't know if it was sent to somebody. Maybe that's how he, uh, he has these, but it was a biblical verse and it's quite long. We'll put all these images and stuff on our website so you can go look at the shrine. I and... might know it. I have the Bible memorized. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know what it is. But the one part says, quote, her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. So this was from June. I don't know, again, if this was sent or found on his phone, but like still disturbing. Oh, my God. I mean, it's not things are not looking good for Larry. Why is Larry still free? I don't know. Or with his children. God help those kids. God help those children. So finally, Maya had reached out to, you know, all, so basically you can see from the shrine, all these things, like their relationship was not great. And I think after all of this shit had gone on, she finally reached out to a divorce attorney and the day she filled out the intake form for her appointment, which was like five days later, which was going to be after her daughter's birthday on a Tuesday. Um, that's the last time anyone had saw her. (sighs) So more of that statement that Larry, when he was talking about Billy, it kind of, it continued, but it said, uh, quote, more lies, implications, and speculations. I do not hate anyone and just hope people can stop spreading lies and making our lives into entertainment in the media. We are already going through a difficult time. He's been, oh, and this was talking about Billy. He's been untruthful from the start and seems to be willing to do anything, including manipulating the situation. My wife is a good woman and she's missing. Everything else is just noise. Hmm. I'm surprised he's saying anything because he hasn't. He has a lawyer and I'm sure his lawyer is probably going to be like, shut up. But it reminds me of, yeah, it reminds me of Tom Sharkey talking about Alexis. Mm -hmm. Like, I loved her more than anything, even though she had been telling all of her friends they were going to get divorced and that he was choking her out. And then this one, like, he's sending that altar picture and saying, my wife was a good woman. Like, it's understandable to me. Like, it must be so difficult when somebody goes missing if you were having a tough time in your marriage. But just come clean like what looks more suspicious than not saying it i mean it's totally natural to be like it's been rough but I think it seems he like he's... i think that they oh i don't think he said it's been rough he had said um they argued before she went missing that's what it was i don't think he was maybe a hundred percent truthful about the state of their marriage i think her family was the one that was like no nah, it's been weird have you noticed this because i've been obsessed with true crime for so long and i feel like over the last decade men in this situation have started to admit to that because in the past it'd be like oh no perfect marriage perfect marriage you know like when you watch yeah. confessionals yeah. but now so many people know so much from csi or true crime that just you know can't that, like daddy's listening like you're gonna get caught like you might as well just fess up to it now yeah i don't know if that's a uh, sign of the times that people are more honest about what life is really like or if it's people becoming better criminals because of the shows that we watch i don't know but it's interesting (sighs) so that's kind of yeah that's like the newest i don't know not gossip but like news to kind of come out but uh a week ago the chula vista police department or i'm sorry the captain eric thunberg said that quote this is not a cold case we have an investigator and a team of investigators that we call upon when necessary. That detective has been working this pretty much full time since the get go. I'm sorry. Why are you still holding on to this case? It seems the to be- detective, that detective, like how about a few? I mean, yeah. this is like time is of the essence. So then he goes on to say, we still have a missing persons case. We don't actually have a crime, which is thankful, right? That leaves hope that May is found and found safely. 
At this point, I don't have any information that tells us otherwise, but we'll continue to pull. Like I said, we'll unravel everything that we can to try and find her. I don't sense Pass any it over urgency. to homicide. I'm yeah. seriously going to make some freaking signs and pick it outside the Chula Vista police. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Pass it over. You obviously aren't that interested. Like, move on. I can't. Yeah. I don't I don't like that bureaucratic red tape That's crap. So annoying. Um, and then interestingly, I and I want your opinion on this. Over the past weekend, we saw media coverage showing that Maya's family has taken the search to Hawaii. And this completely confuses me because I know that Larry and May lived, they were from there and then they moved mm -hmm. to California. Um, but there's it been, makes sense to so I say there's been not that we've heard any proof that she's hopped on on a plane or anything. So I, I don't understand. I get just because my husband's from Hawaii, Hawaii is like another country and it's so small and everyone is so connected. I have been with him in multiple countries where he's run into somebody from Hawaii and within five minutes he's found like five connections. Oh yeah, my sister. Oh yeah, my brother. Yeah. So maybe it's just like putting tentacles out to Hawaii. Has anybody heard anything? Maybe she was there recently and might have told a friend. And, well, and Hawaii, sense. Hawaii and California, I feel like so many people go back and forth, like they work in hospitality. Maybe they live in California just covering all their bases, I guess. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Like thinking about people traveling back and forth and the kind of knowing and wanting to see if people have heard anything. Like that's actually a good point too. Or maybe this alleged boyfriend is oh. in Hawaii oh. or his family is or something. Detective Brittany is showing up. And then mm. this came out literally today. So around noon today, CBS 8 Chula Vista detectives again spoke out. So it's kind of, I'm sure. So this uh, the previous statement that I just read was about a week ago. So then wow. today they come back out because I'm sure they got some shit for that comment. Chula Vista detectives are working with the FBI and San Diego County District Attorney's Office in their efforts to find and analyze evidence in this case. They said that every resource is being utilized in the search for, for Maya. Uh, investigators urge community members to report any information about the case to the police department rather than share it on social media, which the department said leads to misinformation and complicates the investigation. We continue to keep May and our oh, <clears throat> we continue to keep May and her family in our thoughts every day and pray for her safe return. I want to thank those that have reached out with information and tips for our detectives. Cases like this can hinge on the smallest piece of information, which may lead to a break in the investigation. And then she says, you know, due to the sensitivity of this case, we will not share details and compromise the investigation. That's it's interesting. So, so wishy-washy. Like, are you it's... one person working on it? Are you with the FBI? Are you like, who, who's doing what? What's the most interesting to me is urging community members to report things to the police and not on social media because normally they're like whatever information you have let us know why aren't they on social media why aren't they looking at every single thing somebody posts join the groups maybe you'll learn something <sighs> it's maddening i'm sure Very that their job is incredibly time consuming and there's tons of paperwork and all of that but it's just so frustrating, all these cases that we hear about where maybe they just don't have the manpower. Maybe they don't, like, I'll sign up to look in the groups like you and I would do it for free. Like, this is why the FBI exists, right? Like, to help yes. resources and not to be, but you're real close to Mexico. Who's to say he didn't, well, whoever did it, didn't drive into Mexico and throw her body over the border. So this could be an international, you know, like, it, there's so many reasons that other agencies could get involved. And it seems like Chula Vista is just not even trying. Know. I'm super disappointed. Um, it, on that note, if you know anything, you can call Crime Stoppers. This specific one is 888-580-8477. Or you can call Chula Vista Police Department, which I don't know if that's going to help, but it's 619-691-5151. Uh, yeah. This, so this is literally changing by the day, the hour. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping now that more and more information's. Listen, allegedly, I think Larry is 
looking pretty guilty, right? And Mm -hmm. more information that makes him kind of look the way he's looking maybe is going to make him make some mistakes. Is maybe going to show us something or, you know, I don't know. But I just That's what I thought, but it's been Mm -hmm. way too long. It's been too long for that. Like, when did she go missing? What month was it? January. January. Yeah, I don't... Get those kids out of that house. How about that? That's it's. It kind of gave me the chills when you were talking about Mexico because I didn't even think about it. I just went with oh, your yeah. story of like went to the beach, possibly did something at the beach. But yeah, it's a hop, skip, and a jump. You and I could get in our car, go right. down there, and come and back and be done back by dinner time. Totally. And we're two hours away or an hour and a half, whatever. Yeah, and we're they're, farther. They're right by the border right by the border and something else about chula vista is i know it has a very high crime rate so maybe they are inundated with with crimes but reach out for help like what about this freaking cold case guy i mean he is a legitimate attorney whether he's i don't know or he used to be an investigator so like if he's offering his help who it, Willie it, Billy Little? Yeah, Lil, Billy <laughs> Billy legit. Little it seems the weird to like. Yeah, no. He's a little suspicious to me, with just because of the whole NCIS thing. But he's know. probably exactly like us. We would probably love him. <laughs> <laughs> he probably just said like something vague, and Larry's not listening. He heard what he wanted to hear, or panicked, and thought he had to. This is yeah. kind of goes to people not knowing their rights or not that yeah. I want Larry to know his rights right now, but there is the whole um, uh, military side of it too. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they're the military is not allowing them enough information. There's just so much to this case. Obviously Jenna's obsessed. I'm getting obsessed. We will stay on top of it for all of you. Keeping it, keeping it updated. So it guys thanks for listening and sticking to it and if you know anything or you know make sure you report it because any little tip can help and make sure you subscribe here to the podcast um leave us comments we want to hear from you tell us what you want to hear what you like preferably just compliments nothing negative (laughs) I can't handle anything negative at this point. It's been a few weeks. It's been a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Things are. Anyway. So we will see you guys next time. (laughs) Hopefully we make it through. We make it through. And we'll see you all next time. Be Be safe. safe. And remember to trust. (laughs) That's about how it's going. Can't even do it. Be safe and trust your gut. Adios. See you next time.